describes a 2020 news episode with Diane Sawyer, in which the white people of Appalachia are described as heroic for uh, as a heroic and forgotten group that suffers from oppressive structures. Yet black poverty is often equated with laziness and criminality. Day challenges the conflicting cultural representations of poverty and how in the media, Appalachians are celebrated, even exoticized in some way for their grit and tenacity, while the other group, black women who are poor, are framed as morally deficient. Black women, poor black women, are not portrayed as a forgotten group right today, but rather as a group that has forgotten the importance of hard work, discipline, and morality. Day takes readers beyond the mediated images of black women to systemic, economic, and social conditions that often hinder people who are poor. Lack of transportation, lack of decent housing, the absence of affordable health care, limited access to resources and education. In other words, Day offers a glimpse into the often overlooked structural conditions that persist for those of us with our backs against the wall, as Howard Thurman would say. For many of us, the idea of poverty or economic challenge of, of this depth, it's distant from our everyday reality. Uh, after all, there is a certain level of, of economic privilege and social mobility that comes with being in the academy, or even that comes with having access to higher education. But the reality is that most of us, whether middle class or upper middle class, are but one catastrophic condition away from having our backs against the wall. Despite our best efforts, we can find ourselves one medical emergency, one layoff, one car accident, one terminal diagnosis, one bad investment, one divorce, one illness, one bad choice, one away from being in a predicament for which we did not plan. I feel the spirit at this point, and I preach to myself. Not because of laziness or irresponsibility or carelessness with our resources, but because life happens, difficulties happen, tragedies occur. Any one of us may find ourselves with our backs against the wall because crisis spares no one. Even more so, for black families who tend to have less generational wealth and buying par uh, power to fall back on, and even more so for black women who are arguably among the highest educated in the U.S., yet on average remain the lowest among earners. This has nothing to do with lack of imagination or ingenuity or initiative. It is the reality of living within a system that wasn't built with you in mind. The text that claims our attention today, we have the story of Mela, Noah, Holga, Milka, tears of five women who challenge a system that wasn't built with them in mind. Five women who dare to speak up and speak out. Five women who will not be silent or silenced. Five women who find themselves at the intersection of economic injustice and gender inequity. Now one of the ways to read this text is to suggest that the only reason these five women are mentioned is so that their father's name can be recorded in the text. Some of us only know them as Zelophehad's daughters. But if we read the text from the perspective of Mela, Noah, Holga, Milka, and Tirza, yes, I am saying their names. If we read from the perspective of those who have the least power in the text, there is this, there is more here than simple reinforcement of an ancient patri patrilineal system. God just might have something to say through these unlikely candidates, through these hidden figures. God just might have something to say about what it means to resist systems that weren't built with you in mind. Before entering academia, I spent 20 plus years, 22 almost, wearing a uniform that wasn't crafted with me in mind. My flight suit wasn't cut for curves. My dress blues had to be tailored to accommodate for a curvy 
everybody. My flight cap was driven the cold, didn't allow for my curly hair. There was something about the way it stuck out under the sides that I was constantly being told you need to slick your hair down because it was a system that wasn't built. With me in mind, thankfully, I can say that by now some of those very regulations have changed. But I know I'm not the only one in here who has ever found themselves in positions and at tables that clearly were not built with you in mind, regardless of your positionality. It doesn't take long to notice operative frameworks that reinforce dichotomies of those who serve and those who are served, those who teach and those who must be taught, those who and those who must be led, those who pour, and those who must be poured into systems not built with us in mind. The daughters, the daughters in the text challenge a system that had left them out. Our colleague and friend, Dr. Kim Rassau, asserts that when we see the term daughter in the text, it's intentionally used to convey that these women are not mothers, they are not wives, they are not widows, they may or may not be of marrying age. Daughters in the ancient world are positioned at those with marginal to little power. In other words, their social position carries no capital. And still they come boldly before the tent of meeting, the place where the people of God assemble to hear from God and to adjudicate difficult uh, uh, disagreements. One scholar notes how in some instances the whole male population would show up to hear cases. So can you imagine five sun-kissed sisters standing before the population of what could have been 600,000 men. This narrative is one of a series to be a series of cases to be decided by what is known as oracle. Leviticus 23, 24, we see the oracle for those who blaspheme against God. Numbers 9, we see the oracle for those who are impure according to the law. Numbers 15, we see the oracle for those who violate the rules of Sabbath. In each case, Moses must go back and consult with God because the condition raised was not considered in the initial divine legislation. Watch, walk with me, I'm going to the The condition raised was not considered in the divine, in initial divine legislation. Land distribution, where there is no male heir, was a condition that was not considered in the initial patrilineal distribution plan. As we reflect on the civil rights movement today, I am reminded of adjustments to legislation because the conditions raised were not considered in the initial legislation. Perhaps, perhaps it's more accurate to say the initial legislation was not passed with the flourishing of all people in mind, and definitely not African Americans. 1787, the Constitutional Convention agreed to what would become known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. Paraphrase, representatives and direct taxes determined by the whole number of, were determined by the whole number of free persons and excluding Indians, not taxed, I'm just using the language of the writing, three-fifths of all other persons. Well, who were the other persons? All right, y'all know. <laughs> 1868 brought the ratification of the 14th Amendment, granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the U.S., including far formerly enslaved people. Civil Rights Act of 1875 bars discrimination in, in public places and on public conveyances. It sounds like progress until the introduction of black codes and Jane and Jim Crow laws, which effectively gut the rights of African Americans. It would African Americans. It would take nearly a hundred years to redress 1875 to the 1960s to redress the conditions that the initial legislation did not address or enforce. Civil Rights Act 1964 prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin. Voting Rights Act of 1965 
25 suspends, suspends the use of literacy tests. This is after the 24th Amendment, which prohibited the poll tax. Civil rights after 1968 prohibits the use of force against persons. Lord have mercy. 1968 prohibited the use of force against folk based on race, religion, national origin, yet here we are in 2023. Well, I'm not really trying to give a history lesson unless this is not part of your, the history you learned. In that case, I am trying to give a history lesson. <laughs> It was about the long-term implementation. 
implications of issuing legislation that was delayed or dismissed. This biblical narrative is about more than these daughters of their father or the land. It's a narrative of persistence, of tenacity, of, of resistance, of resilient, resiliency. It's a narrative that has an arc. It's a narrative of willingness to look beyond what you can see in the moment, a narrative of those who dare to dream, a narrative of those who question what is and what can be, a narrative of those who dare to talk back to the system, a narrative of those who refuse to accept things as they are, of those who understand where there is no justice, there is no peace. Mela Hoga, Noah Hoga, Noah tears have found themselves in a situation that was untenable and unsustainable. African Americans continue to find themselves in conditions and situations that are untenable and unsustainable. I did not watch the recent recording of the beating of Tyree Nichols. As the mother of an almost 18-year-old young boy, I could not watch it again. See, because my heart is still broken from Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy with a play gun who was shot in less than two seconds. When that occurred, my then son, who was nine, saw it and said to me, Mommy, will they shoot me too? So I, despite my smile, have the brokenness of seeing it over and over and don't need to see it again to know what it feels like to worry every time he leaves my house. To worry every time he says, I'm going to the movies on a Saturday night, and all I'm thinking is, oh, what time? I, 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 I'm up. Let me just say it like that. These conditions are untenable and unsustainable. May the Noah Hoka milk of tears of five women who address the conditions of their day even if it was unfinished. Diane Nash, Leah Chase, Merle, Merle and, and Evers, Dorothy Hyde, Ella Baker, five women who addressed the conditions of the civil rights movement, movement knowing it was unfinished business. Willie White, Rufus Burrow, Karen Baker Fletcher, Margaret Harrell, and Dean Leah Gunning Francis, five people right here at CTS who address the conditions of CTS knowing it is unfinished business. I don't have time to call the names of people who do the work, many sitting right here, but I leave you with these two behavioral responses. After all, I am a homiletics professor, so. <laughs> two things, advocate for yourself. They didn't ask. They asserted themselves and spoke truth to power. In the words of Audre Lorde, your silence will not protect you because you were never meant to survive. When we speak out, the visibility that makes us most vulnerable is also the source of our greatest strength. The second thing, align yourselves with some people who have your best interests in mind. They came forward as sisters, but let me just say this. You don't need a tribe that looks like you. They don't need to be related to you. You don't have to agree on everything. They don't need to love who you love. You don't need to love who they love. We just need to be folk who are willing and committed to the same type of, type of equality and justice. Align yourselves with people who show up at the tent of meeting with you, at the table with you, at the church with you, at the courthouse with you, in the classroom with you. We are not naive. We have un 
unfinished business. We are encouraged by the psalmist or by the hymnist. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will <laughs> take care of you. Beneath God's wings of love abide, God will take care of you no matter. 